This is Audible. Tantor Audio presents Gangland New York, The Places and Faces of Mob History by Anthony M. DiStefano Narrated by Gary Galone Introduction The American Mafia is one of our best-known secret societies. This oxymoron stems from the fact that over the years countless investigations, informants, trials, and publicity have made the mob and its business as familiar to us as our favorite sports teams. Stories about organized crime and its romantic notions of loyalty, blood oaths, and secret ceremonies abound. La Cosa Nostra, or This Thing of Ours, as gangsters refer to it, is really our thing in terms of the way the Mafia has invaded the popular culture and psyche. Francis Ford Coppola's The Godfather and The Godfather Part II are among the top 100 films in American history, according to the American Film Institute. Those two films and their popularity set the stage for hit television shows like The Sopranos and Boardwalk Empire. The Biography Channel has come along with its mobster series, and then there is the mini-franchise created by Mob Wives. The mob has kept legions of writers busy, myself included, for most of our professional lives as we track the often violent, exploitive, and yes, sometimes exciting lives of criminals who became legends through their infamy. But as anybody who has any awareness of organized crime knows, it's not just an Italian phenomenon. Particularly in New York City, organized crime has been a staple of life in many communities. Each immigration stream to the city helped create a series of criminal organizations which, from at least the mid-19th century, controlled or influenced life and death. Early on, the Irish were involved, as were the Jews and the Chinese. In the early 20th century, Italian criminals earned their own reputation through the Mafia and the so-called Black Hand, a strange and terrifying kind of extortion racket which preyed on the fears and ignorance of immigrants from Italy's Mezzogiorno. Later came the Greek and Eastern European gangsters, notably the Albanians and Russians, who carved their own niches and, where necessary, forged alliances with the traditional mafia. Let us also not forget the black and Hispanic gangsters who made money in the drug trade and other rackets, making their own accommodations and alliances with the mafia along the way, when necessary. The long arm of the South American drug cartels has reached into the city for decades and has led to countless murders. The successors to Harlem gangsters like Leroy Nicky Barnes and Frank Lucas are largely 20-something street toughs who today try to emulate the gangster life by pushing drugs in the housing projects. Decades ago, the Chinese tongs would put up wall posters in Chinatown to warn of trouble. Now, black and Hispanic gang members foolishly brag about their exploits on Facebook or wall graffiti, all of which tips off the New York Police Department. New York City is in a constant state of renewal. Since the early years of the 21st century, Manhattan's skyline has changed enormously. Even the waterfront has shed its gritty and dilapidated docks, replacing them with urban recreation zones and walking paths. Where Brooklyn longshoremen used to sweat under the thumb of the mob, young families can now rent kayaks and picnic. However, if you know a fair amount about the crime history of the city, as I do, you can still see many of the locales that have earned a special place in criminal lore. Armed with this knowledge, Anyone can easily imagine what the city was like so long ago. Embracing this history makes you aware of all the things that have come before us in this fascinating city. Walking from my office in Lower Manhattan, I often find myself heading toward Chinatown in the intersection of Worth and Baxter Streets, just outside the Daniel Patrick Moynihan Federal Courthouse. Once known as the Five Points for the way streets intersected, the spot was the first notorious center of crime in New York, it was popularized in Martin Scorsese's 2002 film, Gangs of New York. Now the area is occupied largely by Columbus Park, where on most days you will find Chinese musicians playing lyrical Asian folk tunes as men play the Chinese version of checkers. Fortune tellers ply their trade, and children play on slides or take to the artificial turf of an athletic field off Mulberry Street. More than a century earlier, the neighborhood, known as Mulberry Bend, was home to dens of thieves and impoverished Italian immigrants who scraped by any way they could. It was a place that even in the late 19th century was considered so filthy and odious 
that the city every few days would send large trucks filled with a solution of carbolic acid, chloride of mercury, and potash to flush the gutters, streets, and houses where stale beer was sold for two cents a glass. It was around these vermin-infested hovels that photojournalist Jacob Reese took the iconic photographs of bandits hanging out at Donovan's Lane, another infamous thoroughfare of the criminal class. Immediately to the west of Columbus Park is the courthouse complex on Center Street with a new house of detention. But in the 19th century, what is now a park outside the criminal court used to be home to the tombs. The notorious jail which was built on ground above the old Collect Pond, once a draw for the early settlers of Manhattan. The ground under the jail would inexorably sink into the saturated earth, forcing the city to abandon the site. The tens of thousands who pass by this location daily or lounge on its park benches are likely unaware that it was within the walls of the tombs that the more notorious members of New York's original gangs, as well as other murderers, were executed by hanging from two sets of gallows. Walking just a few short blocks north, you will come across places known for celebrated gangland murders, such as the 1972 slaying outside Umberto's Clam House of Joey Crazy Joe Gallo, or the 1983 shooting of Chinese gang leader Michael Chen on Pell Street. Around the corner from Pell Street is the angled Doyer Street, where the Chinatown Tong Wars littered the pavement with blood and bodies during their battles of the early 20th century. Then there is the site of the old Ravenite Social Club on Mulberry Street, where the late John J. Gotti held court and got arrested for the last time one frigid December night in 1990. Gotti's fate was sealed by secret FBI recordings made by a bug planted in an apartment three floors up from the club. Those are just a few of the sites within easy walking distance of the five points. Walk a bit farther, and you will come across many other infamous places. While the history and headlines of organized crime may be largely focused in Manhattan, anyone who has looked into the various mobs operating in the Big Apple knows that all the other boroughs have also earned spots on a list of important places in crime lore. Inside the long-defunct Nuova Villa Tamaro restaurant in Coney Island one afternoon in 1931, the feared and hated mob boss Joseph Masseria was shot dead in a coup by his rivals while waiting for his lunch. This was one of the seismic episodes in the 1930s which set the stage for modern organized crime. On a quiet residential street in Brooklyn, the loan shark James Jimmy Doyle Plumeri was dumped after being strangled in 1971. Powerful mafia captain Anthony, Little Augie Paisano, Carfano, and former beauty contestant Janice Drake were shot dead in a car on a quiet Queen Street in 1959. Forty years later, on a quiet Bronx Street, Bonanno crime family captain Gerlando George from Canada, Skiasha, was found with numerous bullet holes in his face and body after being killed on orders from family boss Joseph Messino a murder which forever soured the alliance between the Canadian mob and the Bonanno family. Another one of Messino's victims, Sonny Black Napolitano, was killed in the basement of a house on Staten Island and buried in a body bag in a wooded area near South Street. Like Napolitano, lots of mob-hit victims were unceremoniously disposed of without the benefits of receiving last rites or a proper burial. Staten Island was a favorite dumping ground of killer Thomas Tommy Karate Patera, since it had a lot of wooded areas and nature preserves. Then there was a vacant lot off Ruby Street on the Queens-Brooklyn border, where in May 1981 three Bonanno crime family captains were hastily buried after being slaughtered in a Brooklyn social club. Concrete was also a way of hiding the dead. When Mafia cops Louis Eppolito and Stephen Caracappa abducted and killed diamond merchant Israel Greenwald, they forced the owner of a Brooklyn parking lot to dig a grave in a small garage, where they dropped in the body and then filled the hole with concrete. Those who have died at the hands of La Cosa Nostra suffered terrible fates. They were shot, tortured, garroted, dismembered, dissolved in acid baths, dumped in the river, or incinerated. There was a time in the 1970s when the shoreline of Queens was littered with the torsos and limbs of errant gangsters. And, of course, the mortal remains of a number of mob victims have never been found. But taphophiles, those who are interested in all things related to cemeteries, 
can take heart in knowing that a number of New York City's burial grounds are graced with the burials of some infamous mafiosi who had the luxury of dying more conveniently. Very often their funerals were spectacles of the day. St. John's Cemetery in Queens is the leader, serving as the resting place for ten mafia bosses. Carlo Gambino, Joe Colombo, John Gotti, Charles Lucky Luciano, Salvatore Maranzano, Joseph M. Profacci, Philip Rustelli, Vito Genovese, Carmine Galanti, and Salvatore D'Aquila. Brooklyn's Greenwood, the city's largest cemetery and arguably the most historically significant, is where Joey Gallo, his brothers Larry and Albert, as well as the once-feared Albert Anastasia reside. A lesser-known Brooklyn burial ground, Holy Cross Cemetery, is where Frankie Yale was put to rest after he was shot dead in a 1928 car chase. Two of Yale's allies, the Abatamarco brothers, are also interred there. With so many disparate places linked to the history of the mob, a historic guide to the places and faces of gangster life in New York City, complete with maps, seems appropriate. The result is Gangland New York, the places and faces of mob history. Inspired by Forgotten New York, Kevin Walsh's delightful book about the often lost or overlooked remnants, avenues, parks, and artifacts which abound in the city, Gangland New York is a guide to the geography of gangster life, a traveler's companion to the rotten apples landscape of crime, which doesn't have historical plaques or markers to tell us where all things criminal happened. In fact, the only signage related to the crimes of the past is a Department of Parks notice in Columbus Park by the old Five Points, which summarizes the place's former infamy. Given the decades spanned in the chapters that follow, Gangland New York provides a sort of archaeological tour of the city's organized crime world, with maps to highlight the key places in this often bloody history. In piecing together the multitude of stories, I have relied on many old newspaper accounts, public and private archives, and court records, as well as crime classics like Herbert Asbury's The Gangs of New York, and more contemporary books like Selwyn Rabb's Five Families, Virgil Peterson's The Mob, and Jerry Capici's Great Primer, The Complete Idiot's Guide to the Mafia. I consulted the National Archives, repository of hundreds of linear feet of records compiled by the Kefauver Committee, formerly known as the Special Committee to Investigate Organized Crime in Interstate Commerce of 1950, which riveted the national television audience with evidence about the Mafia in the United States. A research gem I uncovered along the way was the City of New York's City Hall Library, which is a repository of a great many books about old New York, as well as documents about the police department. For years I have possessed what I believe to be one of the few original mimeographed copies of the report by the New York State Commission of Investigation to Governor Avril Harriman, on the 1957 meeting of Mafia leaders in Appalachian, New York, a treasure trove of information about some of the biggest names of La Cosa Nostra. The result of all this research is this book, which captures some of the most important moments and personalities in mob life in New York City, across the five boroughs and within numerous ethnic groups. These are the places where gangsters lived, worked, played, murdered, and often died. In some cases, their funerals and burials became spectacles rivaling those normally reserved for heads of state. Gangland New York is organized around each of the five boroughs and written in chronological fashion for each area of the city. Since each chapter is driven by a timeline, the entries are grouped around events which follow a sequence of years, and not necessarily because they have any special relationship. Manhattan, which since about 1850 has been the center of gangster life, has the most entries. Next are Brooklyn and Queens, but each borough is represented in some fashion. This is not meant to be an exhaustive catalog of mob history and its subjects and personalities. Plenty of murders, mostly of low-level people, aren't included. Personalities and events outside of New York City limits also don't make the cut which is why Dutch Schultz's murder in a New Jersey restaurant isn't included in any detail. At first I tried to keep the subjects to an even 100, but that proved impossible with a history of organized crime in the city spanning nearly 175 years and numerous crime groups.
Another challenge was to make the subjects eclectic enough to include some of the most infamous people and events, as well as some of the more obscure and overlooked, which still played a part in the history of crime in the city. Other writers and crime buffs might have different opinions about whom and what to include, and I certainly would respect their choices. The distillation here is mine alone, based on my own expertise, historical perspective and judgment, with a bit of serendipity thrown in as well. I should also make a point about the many addresses and pieces of property featured in these chapters. While the events depicted in Gangland, New York happened over a long period of time, the current property owners have no connection to any of the unsavory things or crime groups involved. Of course, history will forever make a certain criminal connection to those places undeniable. There was a time when being a gangster in New York meant enjoying celebrity status. Lucky Luciano lived in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel until he was evicted, and Frank Costello was courted by judges and politicians. Those days are over. Anybody with a mob pedigree is generally held at arm's length, save for the celebrity women of mob wives who have made their somewhat attenuated ties to the mafia a steady source of fame and income. Although the late John Gotti was popularized by television as he tried to emulate the lifestyle of the old mob bosses, with his expensive suits and incessant Manhattan nightlife, in the end, he was an anachronism, a showy personality who was playing the gangster role but lacked the political and social ties of those who once ruled the mob. The public and the press may have loved the Gotti mystique, but outside of his world he had little of the clout and higher connections possessed by the likes of Costello, Luciano, and Thomas Lucchese. Make no mistake, Gotti had power in his world, and with one word could have someone killed, but his sphere of influence wasn't as great as what we saw in the old days of the mob. One of the reasons is that in today's gangster world, loyalty hardly seems to matter. You have to understand the world has changed, a Brooklyn detective said as he convinced Bert Kaplan the businessman who was the Lucchese crime family's link with the infamous mafia cops, to cooperate with prosecutors. The old world doesn't exist. The codes of honor are a joke. Nobody stays silent. We have guys lining up to talk to us now. Faced with draconian sentences and aggressive prosecutors, many criminals, both young and old, simply turned into cooperating witnesses to save their skins, as Kaplan did. That's what happened to Gotti as he steadfastly remained true to his personal code, even as those around him surrendered to the government juggernaut. No matter how unappealing and marginalized real-life gangsters have become, we are still captivated by the life, as the mob men call their not-so-secret society. Gangland New York serves as an evocative guide for those who wish to tour the neighborhoods of this historic gallery of rogues. Anthony M. DiStefano New York, New York. Chapter 1. The Rise and Fall of the Five Points, 1800 to 1895. If ever there was a devil's cauldron for organized crime in the history of old New York City, it was the place known as the Five Points. Adjacent to a stinking urban swamp known both as the Collect Pond and Fresh Water Pond, the Five Points became synonymous with evil. A back alley where the poor, sailors, Irish immigrants, freed slaves, and those of a criminal mindset coalesced around an old structure known as Coulter's Brewery. The brewery was a squalid structure that housed hundreds of men, women, and children of all ages. Wooden buildings sprouted up nearby and housed thousands more poor souls. The murderous and larcenous bent of these inhabitants earned the place the sobriquets of Murderer's Alley and Den of Thieves. At the time, it was touted as the closest thing to hell on earth. This is the place, these narrow ways diverging to the right and left and reeking everywhere with dirt and filth, was how English novelist Charles Dickens described the neighborhood in 1842 after a visit to the city. Frontiersman Davy Crockett, no shrinking violet when it came to tough situations, once toured the area and after seeing more drunk men and women than he had ever experienced in his travels, remarked, I would rather risk myself in an Indian fight than venture among these creatures after night. These are worse than savages. They are too mean to swab Hell's Kitchen. The neighborhood took its name from the intersection of three streets, Anthony, Cross, Orange, and the contiguity of Little Water, 
located roughly a quarter mile northeast of City Hall. But don't look to find all of those names today. Anthony is known as Worth Street, Cross is Moscow Street, and Orange turned into Baxter Street. Only Baxter and Worth intersect today. Moscow Street no longer goes to the intersection since it is truncated by Columbus Park. Little Water Street disappeared from city maps altogether. Mulberry Street, although not at that precise intersection, was also considered part of the Five Points, and still exists today as a thoroughfare through Little Italy and Chinatown. Though it once surrounded a place known, ironically, as Paradise Square, the Five Points remained squalid and an incubator of New York's criminal life for many years. Things were not always so bad in the Five Points. Before it turned into a large outdoor sewer, the Collect Pond, the name is said to derive from the Dutch word kolk or kalk, meaning a small body of water, was a place for picnicking. The pond's water was used to make tea. Prior to the Dutch and English settling in the area in earnest, the pond was used by local Indians and heaps of old oyster shells on the West Bank were monuments to their presence. The one macabre element was that African slaves were said to have been executed on a spot of land known as Magazine Island, located in the midst of the water at a spot occupied today by Pearl Street and Center Street. A half block to the west is the old Negro Burial Ground, now known as the African Burial Ground National Monument, and signifying what is left of the place where slaves were buried in 18th century Manhattan. Fed by underground springs, the collect was deep enough for small boats, the pond attracted a brewery, tanneries, and slaughterhouses. But all of that commerce and the large population led to pollution. By 1811, the city finally filled in the pond with earth and debris from a hill which stood approximately to the northeast. Still, despite the disappearance of the collect, the awful living conditions in the neighborhood led to three outbreaks of cholera. The saloons which sprouted like mushrooms in the five points attracted hordes of drunks from near and far. Charity workers visiting tenements to care for children would sometimes find all the adults in an apartment lying in a drunken stupor on the floor. Prostitution was also rampant. Some of the streets housed a brothel in almost every building. Every house was a filthy brothel, the resort of persons of every sex, age, color, and nationality, one historian wrote in 1849. The sex business also led to a particular kind of larceny in which a prostitute, would make so much noise servicing her client that the man didn't notice a wall panel open, allowing thieves to pick the pocket of his coat or pants which had been left on a chair near the wall. This particular brothel was known as a panel house. Women, it turned out, did more than work in bordellos or apply drinks in the Five Points. They also nurtured some of the city's early gang culture. Rosanna Piers, who ran a grocery store noted for its rotting and barely palatable vegetables, also had a speakeasy at the intersection of what are known today as Worth and Center Streets. More than a century later, newspaper columnist Walter Winchell dubbed Piers as the first owner of a speakeasy in the city. Known for its potent, cheap liquor, Piers's establishment became a place where local gangsters, pickpockets, and thieves congregated, much like the social clubs of the Mafia a century later. Eventually, the criminals coalesced into the Forty Thieves, believed to be the first organized gang in the city's history. The leader was one Edward Coleman, and children who aspired to be pickpockets, or worse, were organized into an affiliated group known, not surprisingly, as the Little Forty Thieves. Coleman may have been more like the Dickensian character Fagan than a gang leader, it wasn't long before other criminal groups had willing recruits from the desperate residents of the Five Points and its environs, notably the Bowery area located just to the northeast. Theaters, beer halls, and concert halls took root along the Bowery, and for a time it drew a respectable clientele. But after a while, the quality of the entertainment dropped off, and the Bowery became its own haven for gangs. Like the Five Points gangs, the Bowery mobs were sometimes comprised of ethnic Irish, but ethnic solidarity, or in this case the lack of it, didn't stop them from warring, and the fights between the Bowery Boys and the Dead Rabbits were legendary. Fighting broke out constantly in the Five Points, along the Bowery, or in an area just north of Grand Street. 
Among the battlers for the dead rabbits was another gangster woman known as Hellcat Maggie. Stories from the time she was active, around 1840, distinguished Maggie as a ferocious fighter who had filed her teeth to points and wore claw-like nails on her hands. This made Maggie a double threat in hand-to-hand -hand combat, as she could slash with her hands and do serious damage with her mouth. Leaping into a street fight, Maggie was known to shriek a battle cry before she would rush, biting and clawing into the midst of opposing gangsters. Even the most stout-hearted blanched and fled, said author Herbert Asbury. Maggie was an Irish immigrant of about twenty years old who fought alongside the dead rabbits as they did battle with the anti-Irish Bowery boys. She would be portrayed in brutal fashion in Scorsese's 2002 movie version of Asbury's book by actress Cara Seymour. Maggie was only rivaled in reputation by another woman named Sadie Farrell, known as Sadie the Goat, who earned her moniker because her forte in street fighting was to butt her head against her opponent. New York City was one of the largest maritime ports in the nation, and thus a target for pirates, who seemed to strike with abandon up and down the docks of Manhattan Island. One of the New York gangs which took to raiding vessels was called the Daybreak Boys, led by Nicholas Howlett and William Saul. The enterprising pair had their men strike before sunrise, hence the gang's name, reportedly raking in as much as $200,000 in booty from the vessels they targeted, a princely sum in those days. The police of the time were unprepared to deal with this waterfront thievery and crime, readily admitting to Manhattan newspaper reporters that there was little they could do to stop the thieves. The wharves were too numerous and the opportunities for pillaging too plentiful for the police to do anything to stop the brash and ingenious pirates. They are like wharf rats, as much at home in the water as on shore, was how the Brooklyn Daily Eagle once described the pirates. When they have committed a robbery or a murder, if too closely chased, they are prepared to jump overboard, dive under a pier, and thus escape arrest or even detection, as has often been done. The Daybreak Boys' penchant for violence is what led to the undoing of Howlett and Saul. It happened during a raid on the sloop Thomas Watson while it was anchored off Oliver Street on the East River, a street now cut off from the river by a housing development. When the gang shot and killed night watchman Charles Baxter with a bullet through his neck, the gunfire alerted police, who cornered the gang at the nearby Slaughterhouse Inn. After a three-hour standoff, both Howlett and Saul surrendered. After a trial, Howlett and Saul were convicted of Baxter's murder, while a third gang member, William Johnson, cooperated with police. The sentence for Howlett and Saul was death, possibly the first instance of capital punishment meted out against a gang leader in New York City history. Their execution was slated for the Tombs, a city prison which had been built, rather unwisely, on the site of the old Collect Pond. The shifting ground under the prison would eventually lead to its demolition, but that was years in the future. The jail had a pair of gallows and occupied the block on Center Street between Leonard and Franklin Streets. Howlett and Saul were executed on January 28, 1853, and the event was a spectacle. News reporters were given amazing access to the prison, with the Times chronicling in minute detail how they slept soundly the night before and refreshed themselves in the morning with cold water from the Croton Pipes, the new aqueduct which had been built to bring water into Manhattan. Howlett ate what was described as a sumptuous breakfast, while a depressed Saul had no appetite. Before the noon hour of the execution, both men met briefly and shook hands with friends like William Poole and pugilist Tom Heyer, who will be mentioned in greater detail later in this chapter. Once on the gallows, it was Saul who appeared the most contrite and resigned to his fate, praying and then taking a moment to tell friends to live in the fear of God. Howlett asked for some chewing tobacco and also prayed. Oh, God, have mercy! Oh, God, protect my poor mother! exclaimed Saul as the hangman put the noose around his neck. A deputy warden who had become close to both condemned men cried as the end neared. Both men died quickly as they dropped although observers said Saul's arms and legs convulsed for a few moments. The crowd which had filled the courtyard of the tombs dispersed, and the remains were turned over to grieving friends of the dead and placed in polished mahogany coffins 
which had plates engraved with their names, date of death, and ages. Howlett was nineteen years old. Saul, twenty. Sadie the goat Feral fared better in piracy than Saul and Howlett. While headbutting gave her a reputation, Feral needed something more substantial to make a living. Eventually, Sadie started a gang of river pirates from Charlton Street who for years plagued the Hudson River. Her crew commandeered a sloop and for months sailed north up the Hudson and raided farmhouses and stately homes, sometimes taking hostages for ransom. Eventually, the local populace got wise and took up arms, making Sadie's kind of piracy too risky. She eventually returned to her old haunts in Manhattan, making peace with her old rival, a woman known as Gallus Mag, who bit her ear off in a fight. Gallus Mag was not a woman to trifle with. One newspaper account of 1872 reported that she had been arrested for brawling with a police officer who was investigating a bar fight in a dance house she ran at 338 Water Street. The name Gallus is said to have come from the suspenders she wore, known as Gallus's back in the day. Sadie is said to have been given her ear back, which she wore in a locket around her neck for the rest of her life. After fading away, Sadie's life and exploits became fodder for 20th century novelists. However, Gallus Mag, otherwise known as Mag Margaret Perry, persists in the city's memory through the old hole-in-the-wall saloon she frequented. The site of the saloon, 279 Water Street, is now known as the Bridge Café, near the current site of the South Street Seaport. During the heyday of river piracy, the saloon was a hangout for the Daybreak Gang. The popular Bridge Café, about two blocks from the East River, was damaged during Hurricane Sandy in 2012, but survived and is being refurbished, its aging clapboard siding a reminder of its vintage. It is reputed to be the oldest saloon in New York City. Gambling, politics, and gangs worked well together in the mid-19th century in Manhattan. Gambling parlors were all over the area around City Hall, and some of the establishments were top shelf, complete with servants, food, and musicians at the ready to entertain clientele. With nicely appointed furniture and fixtures, the places resembled the best-run brothels, which weren't very far away. A man eager to make his mark and earn a good wage could look to the gambling halls for a job. Such was the case with John Morrissey, an Irishman from upstate Troy, who excelled at using his fists as a bare-knuckle fighter. The problem for Morrissey is that he decided early in his career to run up against two other street fighters who were just as good as he was, Tom Heyer and William Poole. Heyer, a heavyweight boxing champion, and Poole, butcher by trade from Christopher Street, were among the special group of gangsters who had said farewell at the gallows in January 1853 when Saul and Howlett were hanged for the murder of the watchman aboard the vessel Thomas Watson. Poole and Heyer were two gang leaders closely allied politically to the Know Nothing Party, a deep-seated national movement which counted among its adherents former President Millard Fillmore, who became the party's standard-bearer in the 1856 presidential race, but lost. During the election of 1854 in New York, Poole and his gang of toughs put out the word that they were going to intimidate voters, a threat that some citizens took seriously, forcing them to form their own group to protect polling places. Morrissey joined the citizen poll watchers and amassed sufficient numbers to intimidate Poole and his toughs, who backed off from their raids on polling stations. Morrissey allied himself with Tammany Hall, the Democratic Party organization which had taken up the cause of the new Irish immigrants as a way of gaining new voters. No nothings like Poole and Hire didn't like immigrants, particularly Catholics, Irish, and Germans who were seen as poor and living in slums like the Five Points. Morrissey, being Irish and Catholic, had two strikes against him in Poole's eyes. The Election Day standoff in 1854 didn't help matters. The men became mortal enemies. Morrissey and Poole were such bitter foes that they couldn't stay in the same room without a fight breaking out. In fact, Morrissey attempted to shoot Poole at Stanwix Hall, 579 Broadway, but his handgun misfired three times. Poole was getting ready to attack the befuddled Morrissey with a knife when cops arrived and placed them both under arrest, although nothing came of it. But in the world of New York gangs, arrests weren't much of a deterrent. 
Morrissey and Poole had just been released from police custody when, on a February night in 1855, they both returned to Stanwick's Hall, which at the time was a major entertainment complex with gambling and restaurants in Lower Manhattan. To start things off, a couple of Morrissey's street-fighting friends, Jim Turner and Lou Baker, picked a fight with Poole at the bar. The situation reached a flashpoint when one of Baker's friends, Patrick McLaughlin, spat in Poole's face. Turner pulled a pistol, but was such a bad shot that he wound up wounding himself in the arm with his first bullet. Turner managed to squeeze off another shot and succeeded in wounding Poole in the leg. Baker then weighed in and shot Poole twice, once in the stomach and another time in the chest near the heart. A still feisty pool managed to throw a knife at a fleeing baker, but was a bit shaky and missed his mark. At first, Poole was taken to his home on Christopher Street and expected to recover, but his condition worsened. On March 8, 1855, about two weeks after he was shot, Poole died at his home at 164 Christopher Street. Cemetery records show that he was 33 years and eight months old. Legend has it that his final words from his deathbed were, Goodbye, boys. I die a true American. Poole's funeral was so large that it was described as having almost regal pomp. He was buried at Greenwood Cemetery in Chapter 14. Baker tried to flee the city on a brig headed for the Canary Islands, off the coast of Africa, but a nativist friend of Poole's financier George Law loaned his speedy yacht, the Grape Shot, to law enforcement officials for a transatlantic chase. The grape shot overhauled the vessel carrying the fleeing baker, who was returned to New York. There he was charged, along with Morrissey, Turner, and McLaughlin, in connection with Poole's death. But in three trials, jurors couldn't agree on a verdict, and the case was dropped. William Poole was part of a breed of early New York gangsters who made themselves powerful by using their muscle to help their political agendas. Similar groups, like the American Guards and True Blue Americans, who happened to be Irish, also seemed political. However, many of the other gangs existed to protect their turf and were named for their style of dress. Shirt tails wore their shirts untucked from their pants. Plug uglies had enormous plug hats with high crowns. The Roach Guards had blue striped pants. The Dead Rabbits considered by some historians to be an affiliate of the Roach Guards, wore red stripes and entered battle with a dead rabbit on a pike. Fighting seemed to be the sport of gangs, and large-scale battles in and around the Five Points became legendary, with some volunteer firefighting companies also getting involved. The men who fought weren't just dissolute criminals. Often tradesmen after a day's work would put on their gang clothing and feel like they were a part of something much bigger than their small daily lives. Herbert Asbury in The Gangs of New York said some estimated these groups had over 30,000 members. Street brawls often involved up to a thousand combatants and would leave scores bloodied. Politics sometimes played a part in the bigger brawls. Just before the 1856 mayoral elections, the Dead Rabbits clashed with the Bowery Boys, a nativist group from the Bowery which attacked Five Points polling places. At first, the Bowery group gained the upper hand, but the dead rabbits pulled reinforcements into the area armed with pistols, knives, and other weapons. The fighting went on for hours, and eventually the dead rabbits prevailed, beating back the Bowery boys and in the process assuring victory for Mayor Fernando Wood, who was a favorite of the Irish. But many of the street gangs, while organized in some fashion, weren't money-making operations. Their reasons for existing seemed more rooted in territory and the sense of self-esteem that membership provided. Other groups had a more economic imperative, and in that respect were more of the forerunners of the mafia, which is rooted in making money. One such group was the Wyos, which grew to prominence around the Five Points in the years after the Civil War. The gang was, as Asbury described it, as vicious a collection of thugs, murderers, and thieves as ever operated in the metropolis. It appears to have been the first mafia-like collective of crooks and murderers. Legend had it that the Wyos acquired their name from the peculiar call uttered when they were going to a fight. <laughs>
What made the Wyos different than other gangs was the way the members organized themselves to carry out burglaries, bank robberies, and street thefts, notably pickpocketing. Operating from Baxter Street in the area around the Transfiguration Church on Mott Street, the Wyos became the preeminent gang in the 1880s and 90s. The gang had its fair share of fights, and since many of the members were armed, gunfights were constant. In one case, the Wyos got into a drunken gunfight at a saloon on the Bowery appropriately named the Morgue. It was reported that all the combatants were so inebriated they couldn't shoot straight, and nobody was hurt. But it was cases of both reckless and deliberate shooting which ultimately led to the undoing of two men billed as the greatest leaders of the Wyos, Daniel Driscoll and Danny Lyons. One night in 1887, Driscoll and another man got into a fight after a night of drinking. As it turned out, a 16-year-old young woman named Elizabeth Beasy Garrity, described in the newspapers as a dark-eyed, well-formed girl, had developed a fascination with Driscoll and took to hanging out with him. It was on this fateful night that Driscoll, Garrity, and some others were getting drunk in Chatham Square and decided at 3.50 a.m. to visit a disreputable lodging house at 163 Hester Street. The lodging house owner, who had fought with Driscoll in the past, tried to close the door to keep him out. But the Wyos leader drew his revolver and recklessly fired through the door, mortally wounding Garrity, who was already inside. The autopsy found that she had been shot in the stomach and noted that Garrity was a remarkably beautiful woman. After a widely publicized trial, Driscoll was sentenced to be hanged in the tombs. Execution days were traditionally public spectacles in New York City during this era, and on hanging day the church bells would ring when the condemned was finally swinging from the gallows at the tombs. The newspapers, renowned for their cutthroat competitiveness in chasing a story, increased the public fervor surrounding these events. In the case of Driscoll, his hanging was something the Evening World newspaper covered feverishly, and in the age before smartphones, set up an elaborate Rube Goldberg-style signaling system so that the journalist could quickly get the story out on the street the moment Driscoll was dangling from the rope. A reporter in the courtyard of the tombs would energetically wave a handkerchief the instant Driscoll's body plummeted off the gallows so that another staffer of the newspaper, stationed on the roof of a Leonard Street building adjacent to the tombs, knew that the prisoner had been executed. The man on the rooftop then waved a red flag visible to an associate at the top of the Caldwell Lead Company Tower, two blocks south at what is now the intersection of Center Street and Foley Square. The man at the top of the tower then faced south and waved a similar flag. At Printing House Square, where the newspaper was printed, an employee of the Evening World sat waiting on an office windowsill with binoculars. Once he had spotted the flag being waved at the tower, the newspaper employee alerted his colleagues, who started the printing presses rolling with the story that Driscoll was dead. The Evening World bragged that it had scooped the competition by five minutes in getting the papers on the street. Danny Lyons's demise came about eight months later in rather ignominious fashion. A street tough with a head shaped like a bullet and what was described as a lantern jaw. Lyons had done a couple of years at Sing Sing Prison and had only recently been freed on bail after assaulting a policeman. After taking over the leadership of the Wyos gang following Driscoll's execution, Lyons became a regular at a saloon run by Daniel Murphy at 199 Worth Street, just due west of the Five Points, and an address no longer in existence. One August day in 1887, the 28-year-old Lyons was already three sheets to the wind from a day of drinking when he demanded that barman Walter Butler continue to serve him. Butler refused and Lyons had a tantrum and started throwing bottles around. Murphy caught one of the bottles between the eyes and finally had enough, telling Lyons, Come on, you have to go out. The pugnation's Lyons reached for his pistol, but Murphy already had his own gun drawn and fired at the gang leader, striking him in the side of his head over the right ear. Murphy promptly turned himself in to the police. A smart move, since other wild members who had learned of the shooting wanted to take a piece out of his hide. Murphy claimed self-defense, and even gave cops the gun Lyons had drawn. Meanwhile, Lyons was taken to the local Chambers Street Hospital, where surgeons tried in vain to prevent his death 
by lifting some pieces of his skull to relieve the pressure on his swollen brain. There was no report that Murphy was ever indicted for the shooting, and business at the saloon in the days after the Lyons shooting picked up. Years later, there was some confusion about Lyons' fate, principally with Asbury's account in The Gangs of New York, where he claimed that the Wyos leader was executed on August 21, 1888, in the tombs for the murder of beloved athlete Joseph Quinn. But other news accounts note that the Daniel Lyons who was executed had no relation to the Wyos leader. The deaths of Lyons and Driscoll didn't signal the end of the Wyos, but at the close of the 19th century, the geographic center of the mob, indeed any gang which frequented the Five Points area, was shrinking. There had been some changes over the years as charities like the Five Points Mission, which took over the site of the old brewery, and the Five Points House of Industry worked to improve the situation facing residents, particularly the children. But the dilapidated and dingy houses, the narrow alleyways and filth-lined gutters, did nothing to improve the reputation of the neighborhood. Writer James D. McCabe, Jr. described the locale in Lights and Shadows of New York Life. The sidewalk is almost gone in many places, and the street is full of holes. Some of the buildings are of brick. Others are one- and two-story wooden shanties. All are hideously dirty. On a tour, McCabe found that every dwelling seemed to have a home distillery that produced the vilest and most poisonous compounds, as whiskey, gin, rum, or brandy. Brothels seemed to be almost as plentiful. The city spent a small fortune regularly disinfecting the area known as Mulberry Bend, the part of Mulberry Street at the intersection with Baxter Street that was slightly angled, as it is to this day. Something had to change, and by 1895 the city had finally approved a plan to tear down the Five Points. In June of 1895, the city began auctioning off the dilapidated buildings of the Five Points so that demolition could begin to create a park. The structures, made infamous over the years as hotbeds of gang activity, were sold for as little as a dollar fifty. The winning bidders won the right to tear down the buildings and sell the debris for scrap. They also had the right to obtain back rent from many of the displaced tenants, who were months in arrears and spent their time scurrying around to find new lodgings. Demolition of the Five Points buildings on Baxter Street, Mulberry Bend, and surrounding areas began by June 8, 1895. The park to occupy the new space was designed by Calvert Vaugh, who had co-designed Central Park years earlier. The approximately three-acre parkland, said to be one of New York's first urban parks, was finally opened in the summer of 1897 and was graced with curved walkways, trees, and flowers. Summer concerts gave a nod to the ethnic secession seen in the old Five Points, with a choice of music ranging from Italian operas to Irish folk tunes to standards like My Old Kentucky Home and The Star-Spangled Banner. Chapter 2. The Sicilian Avengers In the tone of its coverage, the establishment press, notably the New York Times, considered the Italian immigrant community as either quaint or poverty-stricken. The Italians were often portrayed as a downtrodden mass which filled the five points in its environs. Naturally, there was some truth behind that stereotyping. The Italians were poor and forced to live in crowded tenements, much as the Irish had experienced years before. The Italians were laborers, rag pickers, boot blacks, and even organ grinders with monkeys. But as Tyler Anbinder noted in his book Five Points, they also introduced fruit and vegetable stands to New York City neighborhoods and put their backs into much of the building and construction which came to define the skyline of the city. Anbinder noted that an 1890 police census found that 49% of the Five Points residents were of Italian ethnicity, while the Irish had shrunk to just 18%. But Italians lived elsewhere in New York City and began having deep-seated issues that went beyond the prejudice they endured as new immigrants. Theirs was a peculiar crime problem that would eventually overtake anything the old Five Points gangs ever did, and would contribute to the disfavor and suspicion Italians faced in later decades. It all started with what became known as the first mafia murder in New York, the slaying of Antonio Flacamillo.
While New York became the center of the five mob families, the first appearance of the Mafia in the United States is widely considered to have been the dealings of the Matranga and Provenzano families in New Orleans, beginning in the 1870s. Carlo and Antonio Matranga, two immigrant brothers from Sicily, parlayed their saloon and brothel earnings into a wider base of extortion and other crimes in the Italian community of that port city. They ultimately tried to target the Provenzano clan's lucrative fruit importation business, and for years the two groups were at war, a conflict that would eventually lead to the death of a police officer and the lynching of some reputed Italian mob members. Police in New York City were watching the situation in New Orleans and became alarmed because they feared similar outbreaks of violence among Italians in their city. Have we imported the mafia along with Italian opera? The Sun newspaper asked rhetorically in a December 1888 headline for a story about an Italian extortion plot in the city. Police and Italian diplomats related stories about how Italians in New York were often the subject of such plots. It seemed as though any time Italians got together, it was the making of a conspiracy. So it seemed to police on the night of October 14, 1888, when Antonio Flacomillo, a cigar merchant, was stabbed to death outside of the Cooper Union at St. Mark's Place. Flacomillo was seen dining earlier at an Italian restaurant known as La Trinacria when he got into some loud quarreling with at least two other men with whom he had been playing a card game. Pulled away from the shouting by a friend, Flacomillo left the restaurant at 8 St. Mark's Place and crossed to the northeast corner of the Institute building. It was there that two brothers who had been with Flacomillo in the restaurant, Carlo and Vincenzo Quattararo, accosted him. Carlo Quattararo, said police, took out a knife and stabbed Flacomillo in the left chest. Back at the restaurant, the Quattararo brothers and others made a pact not to tell police about what had happened. A forerunner, perhaps, of the code of silence that came to be known as Omerta. Flacomillo wasn't an angel by any means. In 1884, he was a suspect in the murder of Carmelo Farak, a tobacco dealer who was found dead on Staten Island of multiple stab wounds, including one to the left side of his chest, much the way Flacomillo died. A sword was found near Farak's body. Although there was strong circumstantial evidence, including the fact that Farak and Flacomillo had quarreled over business and the same woman, officials didn't think prosecuting Flacomillo would be worth the cost and let him go. Flacomillo's murder hit the city at a time when the mafia menace was becoming part of the public consciousness, and the newspapers lost no time in connecting the case to the Italian secret society. The killing was ordered by the Society of Sicilian Avengers known as the Mafia, which has secret branches in this city in New Orleans, blared the New York Herald, which said the crime group was a bunch of cutthroats, counterfeiters, and malefactors of all sorts. It was unclear where the newspapers were getting their information, but it appeared to be from the police. There were stories of how the inner circle of the mafia wanted Flacomillo dead because he might have been an informant, and that they had planned his murder with treachery. The Quattararo brothers fled the city, but while Carlo made it to Italy, his brother Vincenzo turned himself in to authorities, and after a coroner's inquest, was brought to trial for the homicide. The case was handled by Inspector Thomas Burns, who had a reputation as a reformer within the New York police, and who promptly fed the voracious newspapers information about the Mafia connection from his vantage point as head of the Detective Bureau. Vincenzo, who denied being a member of any secret society, offered the alibi that he was with his new wife of eleven days in nearby Mount Vernon around the time of the killing, and presented witnesses who were able to testify in support of his claim. It became clear during the trial that Carlo Quattararo didn't strike the fatal blow which killed Flacomillo, but could have been considered an accessory before the fact. However, there was too much doubt for the jury, which couldn't come to a unanimous decision and freed Quattararo. Upon learning of the verdict, it was said Burns remarked of Italians, They can all go kill each other. As sensational as his early remarks about the mafia may have been, even Burns had to admit that the city wasn't being terrorized by the Italian brigands. In a November 1890 issue of the magazine The Illustrated American, Burns admitted that while members of the Mafia existed in New York City, they have kept quiet. That was certainly true for the city compared to what had occurred in New Orleans, with the fighting and bloodshed seen among the Matranga and Provenzano clans.
But as the Italian community grew larger in Manhattan and its environs, it was only a matter of time before the Mafia would become a major criminal force. However, until the Italian mob became a force to be reckoned with, New York City had some fearsome gangsters who inherited the roles previously held by the Wyos and the Dead Rabbits. Chapter 3 The Eastmans vs. the Five Pointers After the death of legendary gang leaders like William Poole, Daniel Driscoll, and others, two other leaders emerged at the turn of the 20th century to take their turn struggling for supremacy in the changing world of mob activity. One was Paul Kelly, who had led a group known as the Five Pointers, a band of criminals who took their name from the old and displaced Five Points neighborhood. The other was Monk Eastman, whose gang was named after him and known as the Eastmans. Eastman was a headbreaker who looked the part. Described as a short man with unruly hair, pug nose, and cauliflower ears, Eastman had a scarred face and a bull neck that added to his fearsomeness. He always seemed to need a haircut, and he accentuated his ferocious and unusual appearance by affecting a derby hat several sizes too small, was how Arthur Asbury described him. Paul Kelly was actually Italian, and born Paolo Vaccarelli, while Eastman was Jewish and originally named Edward Osterman, although he would sometimes show up in court papers as William Delaney. Kelly wasn't known as a street brawler and thug. In fact, he had the reputation of being a cultured man. But Eastman had such a reputation as a fighter that it was reported ambulance drivers at Bellevue Hospital referred to the emergency ward as the Eastman Pavilion. Although Kelly's five pointers took their name from the old criminal neighborhood in lower Manhattan, the mob operated all around Manhattan, particularly the Bowery. Kelly's base of operations was the new Brighton Dance Hall at 57 to 59 Great Jones Street, a place that attracted a lot of upper-crust New Yorkers. The Eastmans also flourished on the Lower East Side, particularly around Allen and Rivington Streets. They included in their number a young Italian immigrant woman named Driga Coloma, who went by the name of Bridget. An incorrigible girl not even 20 years old, Driga cursed a blue streak to her parents, police, and judges when she was arrested in September 1903 while hiding in an Eastman gang hangout with another woman. Driga's main role in the gang was to hide guns under her skirt and provide entertainment by dancing, or whatever else she might have done. A judge finally sent her away to a reformatory. Kelly and Eastman fell into a long mob war of attrition that plagued the east side and led to a big shootout on Rivington Street, that spread to surrounding areas and lasted from about 9.30 p.m. on September 16, 1903, until around 2 a.m. the next morning. They shot up the town in regular Wild West style, said one police detective. The shooting actually began at a saloon on the northwest corner of First Avenue and First Street and spread to Rivington and Allen Streets, all on the lower east side of Manhattan. Police said some 50 men were involved, and gunshots flashed at every street corner. Bullet holes scarred numerous building facades, and many windows were shattered in the fusillade. As was often the case with Eastman's crew, police were greeted only by silence when they began questioning people in the neighborhood, none of whom claimed to have seen anything. We have arrested them time and time again, but the magistrates let them go, one frustrated police inspector said about the lack of witnesses. Two died in the battle, and others were wounded. With so many brazen shootings and beatings, political bosses had finally had enough and demanded an end to the constant fighting. A 1903 peace conference arranged by Tammany politician Tom Foley got Kelly and Eastman to call a truce. But Eastman, having alienated his political connections when he got arrested in a holdup, was sentenced to ten years in Sing Sing prison in 1904. Police said that Eastman was observed shadowing the drunken son of a man who had paid private detectives to follow the tipsy boy. Eastman was accused of trying to kill one of the private detectives during a brawl that followed. While he was being led to the courtroom from his cell in the tombs for sentencing, Eastman heard the music of an Italian funeral band and is said to have quipped, Thanks, gents, for this flat-ridden serenade. Kelly fared better even if he had to thank his lucky stars at times. Although after Eastman's incarceration, Kelly became the apparent master of gang bosses in Manhattan, 
He faced rivalry that turned deadly at the drop of a hat. His own hat, as it turned out. Early on the morning of November 23, 1905, police responded to reports of shots at Kelly's restaurant at 57 to 59 Great Jones Street. And, after finding the door ajar, entered and found John Harrington, one of Kelly's bodyguards, dead on the floor. Whining near his corpse was Harrington's pet cocker spaniel. It was obvious to police that there had been a major battle at Kelly's club. Upstairs, a meeting room was in disarray, with books and documents strewn around. Chairs and tables were overturned, and there appeared to be numerous bullet holes in the walls. The investigation determined that Harrington was killed in the meeting room fight and his body brought downstairs. The battle started, police said, after four rivals of Kelly's from the rival Liberty Association came to the saloon, apparently to avenge the shooting at the club of a friend some time earlier. The shooting sent bartenders, waitresses, patrons, and Kelly's crews scattering in all directions. Kelly himself had fled the gunfight and was found by police at the home of his cousin James at 1228 Park Avenue in Manhattan. The gang leader was seated in the parlor and smoking a cigar when cops entered, giving the appearance that he was ready for a night out. I was just starting downtown to give myself up, Kelly told the officers. Kelly told police that he had been wounded in the assault and showed them his white waistcoat, which had a bullet hole in it with powder burns. Earlier, detectives had found Kelly's hat at the club with a bullet hole through the crown. Kelly had to testify at a special coroner's hearing, but was never charged. After the killing of Harrington at the club, Kelly moved his base of operations uptown near East Harlem and became a labor leader with the Longshoremen's Union, controlling labor peace on a large section of New York's docks. Around the same time that Kelly switched careers, he also legally changed his name to Antonio Vaccarelli, and professed a desire to live in peace with the police. The switch didn't spare him trouble of a different sort. A dock strike Kelly fomented in 1916 caused West Coast shippers to threaten to send products by rail to the eastern United States, a move that would have increased prices for consumer goods. The strike was settled, and Kelly, or Vaccarelli as he was also known, seemed to fade from public view. He died of natural causes in 1936. Monk Eastman got a chance at redemption thanks to World War I. After being paroled in 1909, Eastman joined a unit of the U.S. Army's 27th Infantry Division, eventually fighting with distinction in France during the war. Once he was demobilized, Eastman returned to New York, where in 1919 Governor Al Smith restored to him the rights of citizenship, which he had previously lost as a convicted felon. Police even offered to line him up with a legitimate job, something that didn't appeal to him. Eastman seemed to stay away from trouble until the day after Christmas in 1920. That evening, as he started to walk up the stairs of the Bluebird Cafe, 62 East 14th Street, Eastman was shot dead by an assassin who pumped four more shots into him as he lay slumped on the sidewalk. The killer, it turned out, was a federal prohibition agent named Jeremiah Bohan who told police that he had an unpleasant argument with Eastman at a Brooklyn cafe some eight months earlier. It was then, said Bohan, that Eastman had pulled a revolver and threatened to shoot him. When Bohan ran into Eastman at the Bluebird, he said an argument had started in which Eastman called him a rat. Bohan said that Eastman, who was later found to be unarmed, reached into his right coat pocket, a furtive move the agent apparently found threatening. In response, Bohan said he shot Eastman numerous times, and then fled. Eastman's killing, along with other incidents, provoked one member of Congress to say that federal prohibition agents were out of control and in need of strong oversight. Back in New York, Eastman's funeral drew thousands who came to pay their respects. His body, dressed in the uniform of an army private, rested in a casket draped with an American flag. Veterans from Eastman's old unit carried the casket to a horse-drawn hearse for a funeral service at the Third Street Methodist Church. At Cypress Hills Cemetery, astride the Brooklyn-Queens border, a firing squad shot three volleys as a bugler sounded taps for the old gang leader, perhaps the only gangster to ever receive that honor. Eastman was a thug, yet a man who seemed to have at least one redeeming quality, personal courage, wrote columnist Henry Irving Dodge in the New York Times. His career was a lurid one, 
involving state's prison and winding up with a military funeral. Eastman's death singled the end of the old era of Manhattan gang leaders who ruled over hundreds of associates with a mix of loyalty, force, and bravado on the streets. Gangs in New York had evolved from cadres of street toughs in the 19th century, bound together mostly by camaraderie, to more economically focused bands of criminals who fought for geographic and business territories. Eastman's old nemesis, Paul Kelly, showed that the gangsters were coming into their own as businessmen, with a seemingly legitimate facade. This would be the future path for many of the mobsters who would follow. Chapter 4 Tales of Bloody Angle A neighborhood in Lower Manhattan considered part of the Five Points was Chinatown. Legend has it that the first Chinese immigrant set up a grocery shop in 1822 on Mott Street, which happened to be one block east of Mulberry Street. Most of the Chinese who came into the area were sailors or merchants, but enough of them settled in the area that by the mid-19th century, Mott Street was the spine of a small Chinese community which slowly spread to encompass Doyers and Pell Streets. While the Five Points neighborhood contained a heavy concentration of Irish gangs, Chinatown developed its own criminal element during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Formed hundreds of years earlier, the Tongs controlled gambling, drug dealing, and the opium dens, and the importation of women for the predominantly male population of the neighborhood. Not all of the women were Asians. A substantial number of consorts and wives of Chinatown men turned out to be Caucasian, and police logs told of a number of rescue efforts to free American women who were living as virtual slaves. The seedy reputation Chinatown acquired in the early 20th century made it a place where the uptown crowd and the rich liked to slum it. Private cars would come into the area late in the evening and popular nightclubs would attract the well-to-do, who became known for their slumming parties. The Pelham Cafe at 12 Pell Street was run by a Jewish impresario and businessman known as Nigger Mike Salter, mainly because of his swarthy complexion. His club became known for a singing waiter named Israel Baleen, whose musical abilities took him further in the business to fame and fortune under the name Irving Berlin. When John Jacob Astor and his wife took a private taxi to Salter's club one evening in January 1906 for a slumming party and a few short beers, the newspapers touted the event as a night out at Nigger Mike's. At nearby 6-8 Doyer Street, there was the Chatham Club, which was a favorite of the white gangster element who mingled with the members of the Tongs. The word Tong literally meant meeting hall or society, and these groups started out as fraternal benevolent associations. But it wasn't long before the Tongs were the main power in Chinatown. Asbury estimates that by the 1890s there were over 200 gambling games along the three main streets of Chinatown and almost as many opium dens affiliated with the Tongs. One notable house of prostitution was located at 18 Mott Street, although any local street or alley had its own special commercial sex establishment. Two Tongs in particular, the Hip Sing and the An Leong, were constantly vying for power and had a number of bloody conflicts over the lucrative sex and drug trade, in which local police were paid bribes to ignore the activity. The Tong conflicts escalated with the appearance of Mock Duck, a portly man who led the Hip Sing Tong. Twice charged with murder, Duck was acquitted each time. His luck also extended to the street, where he once escaped a knife attack, no doubt with the help of a chain mail shirt that he and other Tong fighters wore. Allied with another Chinese group known as the Four Brothers Society, Duck started a struggle for power against the An Leong Tong and its leader, Tom Lee. Sometimes the fighting was petty and involved the An Leong members stealing the crest of its rival off the door of the Hip Sing headquarters building on Pell Street. But at other times, the battles became deadly. Lee actually preceded Duck on the Chinatown scene and had more ability to cross over into mainstream New York politics. Many, including those in the city establishment, considered Lee the unofficial mayor of Chinatown, a reputation that was enhanced when he was given the position of deputy sheriff of New York County. Despite his political stature, or more likely because of it, Lee ran a substantial part of Chinatown's underground economy of gambling and opium dens, with a few brothels spicing things up. Those operations supplemented what were the legitimate businesses of Lee,
restaurants, and cigar stores. Lee's way of doing business was reported at times to be heavy-handed. Historian Timothy Guilfoyle, in his story of the underworld, A Pickpocket's Tale, said that armed with his sheriff's badge, Lee was able to convince Chinatown merchants to open a gambling parlor or opium den in return for a kickback of between five to ten dollars a week. Those tactics, noted Guilfoyle, made Lee unpopular among some Chinese and led to his indictment for extortion, a charge that was later dismissed. A few attempts were made to assassinate Lee, but he survived each time, despite the fact that a bounty of over five thousand dollars was put on his head. Some of the worst of the Tong battles erupted in August 1905, during the presentation of a popular performance at the Chinese Theater at Seven Doyer Street, a short, angled street that ran between Pell and the Bowery. During the performance, someone set off a string of firecrackers near the stage. The sudden noise caused a panic among the nearly 400 patrons crowding the theater, and many tried to escape. But Hip Sing members drew pistols and started shooting at the An Leung associates who were sitting near the stage. The incident left three dead and several wounded, and police immediately suspected Mock Duck. Get that duck dead or alive, said one police sergeant. Duck was found in the hallway of a Bowery building and taken back to the station house. Despite having an alibi from his lawyer, Duck was kept in jail until he was freed on bail. But barely a week after the Chinese theater incident came another murder, this one quite grisly. In retaliation for the shootings at the Chinese theater, several An Leong members burst into the 11th Street laundry of Hop Lee, who was affiliated with the Hip Sing. Armed with hatchets, the assailants began hacking at Lee, cutting off his nose and slicing his face and body. They then, for some strange reason, began tickling his feet with feathers in what police believed was an attempt to torture Lee, who never cried out in protest. Tipped off about the attack, police arrived and rescued Hop Lee, who later died at the hospital. Five An Leong members were arrested. The fighting at the Chinese theater was one of a number of shootings and hatchet attacks that took place all over Chinatown, notably in Crooked Doyer Street. A short street that had two sharp turns, Doyer Street earned the name Bloody Angle because of the casualties that mounted there during the Tong Wars. Things became so bad throughout the Tong Wars that the city would flood the area with policemen, who were sometimes spaced thirty feet apart on Doyer's and Pell Streets, to prevent bloodshed. But even the presence of police in a nearby station house on Elizabeth Street didn't prevent the Tong battles. The Chinese theater became so notorious for several fatal shootings and other incidents that it was finally shut down. Ultimately, through the efforts of Judge Warren W. Foster, the Hip Sing and An Leong Tong signed a fragile truce in 1906, which, with one interruption, lasted until 1909. By the truce terms, the An Leong controlled Mott Street, and the Hip Sing got Pell Street. Doyer Street, the scene of so much bloodshed, was deemed neutral territory. Ultimately, the death of a woman led to a resumption of the terrible hostilities. The story of Bao Kum and her murder is one that illustrates much about Chinatown society in the early 20th century, particularly about the stature of women at the time. Known as Little Flower and Purse of Gold, Bao Kum was sold by her family as a young girl in Canton Province for about $150, to a man who wanted her as a servant girl, known in Chinese culture as a Mui Tsai. But the original purchaser of Bao Kum later turned around and sold her for about three thousand dollars, seventy to eighty thousand in today's dollars, to another Chinese businessman in San Francisco's Chinatown. The businessman, Lao Tang, considered Bao Kum to be his wife, although he didn't treat her well. She eventually escaped and took up refuge at a Christian mission run by Donaldina Cameron. A stout woman of Scottish descent, Cameron was well known to police in San Francisco for helping Chinese slave girls escape from their conditions of servitude, be they prostitutes or domestic slaves. It was through Cameron's intercession that a young Chinese-American vegetable trucker named Chin Lam met and fell in love with Bao Kum. Though already married to a wife who lived in China, Chin Lam took Bao Kum as his wife in a Chinese ceremony, which had no legal standing in California.
The couple then traveled to New York City in mid-1909 and took up residence in an apartment at 17 Mott Street. The couple's escape from San Francisco angered Lao Tang, who had paid $3,000 for the property rights to Bao Kum, and had suffered a terrible loss of face. He either wanted her returned to him or to be repaid the $3,000. But Chin Lam wouldn't agree to give back his bride and merely scoffed at his rival. The stage was set for some big trouble on Mott Street. Lao Tang was a member of the Four Brothers Society, one of Chinatown's Tongs, and the group declared a state of hostility with the rival An Leon Tong, with which Chin Lam was affiliated. The declaration of war was openly noted in Chinatown through the hoisting of red flags over Tong headquarters. Brightly colored posters placed upon billboards on Chinatown streets proclaimed in Chinese script that there would be hell to pay if Bao Kum wasn't returned. The evening of August 15, 1909, was a Saturday night, and Mott Street was filled with the sound of pianos playing in the various restaurants lining the avenue. Sometime after midnight, a suspect or suspects entered the back area of 17 Mott Street and went to the apartment where Bao Kum lived and stabbed her to death. She was found with her oriental silks slashed in many places and her hands clutching at the wound in her breast, according to one account. A few of her fingers were also missing. When Chin Lam discovered his dead wife, he ran from the building and yelled, Murder! Murder! With the help of a nearby Mott Street shop owner and a policeman, Lam re-entered the building through a courtyard and ran up to the second floor, where the body of Bao Kum lay on the floor of a room at the head of the stairs, in a pool of blood. Two gas lights illuminated the room. An eight-inch knife with a bone handle lay on the floor near the body. Crowds soon formed that included a number of Chinese men who lived on the premises with their Caucasian girlfriends and wives. Police originally suspected Lam and arrested him after they found a bloody handprint on a door and determined that it was as long as the hand of Lam. Fingerprints weren't in use at the time. After further investigation, Lao Tang and his sibling Lao Shang, both members of the Four Brothers Society, were tried for the murder in January 1910, but acquitted. Nevertheless, even the court victory didn't quell the violence. The fighting in this particular phase of the Tong Wars saw a great deal of gunplay on the streets, resulting in several murders. On occasion, dynamite was even used. Killings occurred not only in Manhattan but also in Philadelphia, and from the body count it seemed as though the four brothers got the worst of it. Tensions were high, and police found themselves constantly searching the alleys and crannies of Chinatown for suspects, often without luck. But in one case, the assassination on Pell Street of two members of the Four Brothers, detectives were able to break the case because of the testimony of an elderly man who lived in a cubbyhole off Pell Street and made his living selling opium and cleaning opium pipes. Opium dens were common in Chinatown, and an entire cottage industry was formed around their existence. The old man, Ching Kuang Dong, was able to identify the two suspects as Lao Gung and Lu Yo Fang, two members of the An Liang. The warfare only ended after the intervention of a local committee of Chinese merchants and Terence McManus, the skillful attorney for the four brothers, who won an acquittal for both men tried in the Bao Kum slaying. A fragile peace was brokered in April 1910, later broken by more violence the following June. It took until early 1911 for more substantial peace to arrive in Chinatown. The cost in bloodshed was estimated to have been 50 lives. Sporadic outbreaks of violence erupted in the following years, but Chinatown was able to keep its peace until 1924, when more fighting occurred. Later in the 20th century, the influx of more Chinese with the liberalization of U.S. immigration laws brought a different kind of mob violence, a situation that existed well into the 20th century and required more sophisticated law enforcement tactics to combat. Luckily for Mock Duck and Tom Lee, they were able to survive the Tong Wars and both died of natural causes. Duck's story was especially poignant. He had a daughter who was part Caucasian and the offspring of a woman named Lizzie Smith, who had initially been married to another Chinese man. A child welfare agency succeeded in petitioning the courts to have the child taken from Duck. An emotionally shattered Duck then left Chinatown and went around the world, trying to gamble his way out of depression. To his good fortune, Duck won a lot of money, fortifying his stature in Chinatown.
but he never did win back custody of his child. He died in 1941. Given the assassination attempts and threats against his life over the years, Tom Lee led something of a charmed life. He had retreated to a home he owned in the Bronx when the Tong Wars were at their peak. As hostilities subsided, Lee returned to the community and was considered an elder statesman, sponsoring picnics for the neighborhood. Lee died in January 1918 at the age of 76 and was reputed to be one of the oldest Chinese men in Chinatown during that period. Chapter 5 The Rise of the Jewish Gangster Monk Eastman and Paul Kelly, two byproducts of the Five Points criminal world, would in their own way create separate legacies. The groups they led would give rise to the next generation of mobsters who reigned in New York. It was Eastman who enabled a number of Jewish criminals to rise through the ranks. Kelly, known later in life by his true surname of Vaccarelli, did the same for some of the Italians who went on to form the basis of the legendary American Mafia. Jewish immigrants came in droves to the Lower East Side of Manhattan in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Hester Street, Suffolk Street, Norfolk Street, and the surrounding areas became the destination for the influx of Eastern European Jews, who had to make do with living in the crowded tenements, which in some cases were as bad as those found in the old Five Points neighborhood. Yet, as bad as conditions were, even with the new laws which required the barest of conveniences, like running cold water, the Jewish population made its mark. The Lower East Side became a beehive of activity with the garment sweatshop industry. Synagogues began popping up, and a Yiddish theater flourished. There were Yiddish newspapers and eventually settlement houses, where Jews could learn what they needed to to get by in the new country, coalesce, and maintain a cultural identity. But not everybody took to life in America the same way. A significant prostitution trade developed on the East Side, one in which women were imported from Europe to work in Manhattan brothels controlled by Jewish political ward bosses. Other women worked as fences for stolen property. For some of the young Jewish men, like Max Zweifak, who had made his early mark as a bicycle thief, Monk Eastman's gang seemed an attractive career path. It was Zweifak, known by the sobriquet Kid Twist, who eventually became the East Side's rising gangster after Eastman went away to prison in 1905. Zweifak's tenure as a top gangster was short-lived, however. He was gunned down on May 14, 1908 in Coney Island by Louis Piogi, also known as Louis the Lump, a member of Paul Kelly's Five Pointers gang. The motive, according to police and gangland legend, was the fact that Zweifak and Piogi were romantic rivals for a Canadian-born dancer named Carol Terry. The murder was an ambush situation in which Piogi jumped his girlfriend Terry, Zweifak, and another man as they all walked together on Oceanic Walk, a narrow avenue no longer in existence. Zweifak was shot in the head while his friend, an Eastman gangster and Coney Island wrestler named Cyclone Louie, was hit by six bullets and also killed. Terry was knocked to the ground and wounded in the hip. P.O.G. eventually pled guilty to charges of manslaughter and was given an eleven-month sentence. After Zweifak's death, the leadership of the Eastman organization passed to Zelig Zevi Lefkowitz, who earned the moniker Big Jack Zelig. Once just a pickpocket, Zelig developed a terrible temper, and during one November night in 1910 went into a rage at the Chatham Club at 8 Doyer Street in Chinatown, beating up a wannabe gang tough and a couple of others in a brutal fight at the club. A month later, Zelig further burnished his reputation as a fighter at a Madison Square Guard event where he was severely beaten by the man he had fought at the Chatham Club. He went after his assailant despite his own injuries. For a man who had earned his stripes in the underworld as a very adept pickpocket, Zelig saw his share of gunplay. It was in June 1912 that he became involved in a hellacious fight which became known to some as the Battle of Chinatown, stretching the twelve miles from Coney Island to Chinatown in Manhattan. Initially, the cause of the battle was said to have been a woman named Wanda Murphy, who had once been a hanger-on with Zelig, but who had taken up with a faction led by Italian gangster and five-point member Jack Sirocco. However, in her biography of Zelig titled The Starker, Rose Keefe said that the Murphy connection to the fight was later discounted, although she did get involved in the fisticuffs which developed. Things began just before dawn on June 3, 
when Zelig and his cohorts got into a fight with a waiter at a Coney Island cabaret. The evening soured by the fight, Zelig and his group went back to Manhattan and eventually wound up at a Chatham Square saloon owned by Sirocco and his associate, Jack Pogey, at 12 Chatham Square. To make a long, convoluted story short, gunfire erupted in Chinatown at Doyer Street in Chatham Square, where 40 shots were fired. Police moved in and made a number of arrests, including Zelig. Some reports said Zelig and three companions were able to come into Pogey's club by entering through an arcade below the old Mandarin Cafe at 13 Doyer Street. The arrival of police didn't end things, as the suspects, along with Wanda Murphy, got into a brawl at the police station at 19 Elizabeth Street, a structure which today is one of the oldest police precinct buildings in New York City. A carload of Z-League's friends drove to the criminal court building on Center Street, right next to the new Tombs Jail, where Z-League himself had appeared for arraignment. It is there that the story got better, or worse, depending on your point of view. As he stepped outside the courthouse and was about to enter 116 Center Street, Z-League was shot in the neck. Clasping his wound, Z-League made his way into the building and said when medical assistance arrived, Doc... I guess they got me that time, but I don't do no squealing. Zelig's stand-up nature as a taciturn gangster helped him cultivate Tammany Hall politicians, who were able to protect him and secure his release when he was arrested. Useful political connections were a key part of the gangster life in New York, and in Zelig's case, they could have served him well had it not been for the strange series of events surrounding the murder of Herman Rosenthal. Like many of those involved in New York's underworld in the period, Rosenthal was a gambler who started out in life as a flunky for political bosses like Tim Big Tim Sullivan. Although he started out on the lower rungs of the crime ladder, Rosenthal parlayed his association with Sullivan into some serious money-running gambling joints. The cash made Rosenthal protective of his operations and leery of the police. As Keefe noted in her book about Zelig, Rosenthal had... An inflated sense of superiority, combined with the Sullivan connection, which convinced him that splitting his profits with the cops to avoid investigations and raids was beneath him. Well, no matter what Rosenthal felt about his own sense of self-importance, the cops still hassled his clubs, raiding them periodically. He was even indicted for bribery in 1911, but beat the case in a mistrial. The last straw for Rosenthal came in April 1912 after his new club in the Tenderloin section of Manhattan, an area on the west side running from about 23rd Street to 57th Street and encompassing the theater district, was raided and trashed by police under the command of Lieutenant Charles Becker. It was then that Rosenthal turned to Herbert Bayard Swope, a journalist at the New York World. Swope would go on to become editor of the paper and win the Pulitzer Prize. In its time, the world epitomized the best and worst of competitive journalism. The paper was designed to shock and titillate, and did so regularly with stories about sensational murders, executions, adultery, and theft. When he spoke with Swope, Rosenthal alleged that the cops had raided his gambling establishment a number of times. What really angered Rosenthal the most was the fact that despite a friendship he had with Becker, the officer wasn't able to protect him from police raids. Becker was part of a special squad of police who took direction from the commissioner, and even the mayor. Their main brief was to raid the underworld, cutting off gangsters from their sources of income. The problem was that graft and corruption seemed to be endemic in the NYPD at the time, and Becker wasn't immune. Keefe reported in her book that Becker could bank $10,000 a month in numerous accounts, some under his name, others under the name of his wife and false account holders. He also reportedly paid cash for a $9,000 home in Williamsburg. It has never been definitively shown how Becker took graft and what he did in return, although there have been plenty of people who believe he was corrupt. In any case, Becker had ties with Rosenthal that came back to haunt the officer. In July 1912, the world began publishing articles based on affidavits given by Rosenthal, which alleged that he and Becker had a cozy friendship one which led to the gambler borrowing $1,500 from the cop, complete with a promissory note. Along with the debt, Rosenthal alleged that Becker promised to tip him off in advance of any gambling raids and hinted that he could squelch any case that got to the grand jury.
Rosenthal said in the news story that his relationship with Becker finally soured after he had accused the captain in an argument that he had reneged on his promises of protection. Becker said he tried to right the wrong and went so far as to tell the Manhattan District Attorney, Charles Whitman, about what Becker was doing, but was told there wasn't enough evidence for an indictment. Swope's stories were explosive as far as the public was concerned, but the reaction from the police department was tepid. Whitman was quoted as saying that allegations of wrongdoing weren't proof of anything. Rosenthal would never be in a position to give any evidence, even if he could find it. Not long after midnight on July 16, 1912, Rosenthal walked into the Hotel Metropole on the north side of 43rd Street, near the corner of Broadway. The address was 147 West 43rd Street, to be exact. Rosenthal went to the Café Metropole inside the hotel and met with some gambling cronies. At about 1.30 a.m., about an hour after he had arrived at the hotel cafe, Rosenthal went outside to pick up some copies of The World with the latest installment of Swope's story and returned to the cafe. A well-dressed man entered the cafe, approached Rosenthal, and said, Can you come outside a minute, Herman? Rosenthal complied. It was the last thing he ever did. Witnesses recall hearing shots at around 1.57 a.m. A police officer nearby also heard the gunfire and found Rosenthal on his back on the sidewalk outside the hotel entrance. He was quite dead. Although Rosenthal's murder may not have shocked many in the city, particularly among the gambling world, the reaction was different among officialdom. Prosecutor Whitman pressed police to preserve evidence and start following leads. At one point, a number of cops who were in the area of the shooting weren't able to get the license plate number right on the alleged getaway car prompting Whitman to say that something was fishy. It would be idle for me to say that the investigation had not been greatly hampered, but we will go on with it, said Whitman. The investigation ultimately focused on Becker after gambler Jack Rose, the prosecution's star witness, alleged in the grand jury that Becker had ordered him to kill Rosenthal because of the trouble he had been causing the police captain. Becker even reassured Rose that he wouldn't let anything happen to him. What do you think I am in this department? I can do as I damn well please, Becker said, according to Rose's grand jury testimony. On August 20th, 1912, Becker was indicted along with several other men for Rosenthal's murder. A manhunt finally tracked down two of the suspected gunmen in the Bronx, and a trial date was set for the fall. Becker was told by one journalist friend, said to be linked to Tammany Hall, that if he came clean about police corruption... Prosecutor Whitman might show compassion. Whitman was seeking a motherload of information about police corruption in Gotham, which the prosecutors said generated a cash haul of bribes amounting to $2.4 million a year paid to police. If Becker wanted to escape the electric chair, he would have to expose the system of graft rampant among the police, said Whitman. Becker didn't bite. Zelig, the Eastman gang leader, was given a subpoena in early September to testify as a witness for the prosecution in Becker's trial. But during the evening of October 5, 1912, after getting a haircut, Zelig was shot dead on a trolley car as it passed by 2nd Avenue and 14th Street. The gunman was Boston Red Phil Davidson, who claimed self-defense because Zelig had blackjacked him earlier in the day. Zelig had a large funeral not as large as William Poole's, but substantial nonetheless, with about 10,000 mourners gathered outside a tenement located then at 286 Broom Street on Manhattan's Lower East Side. Becker's case had a tortuous legal history, but after his first conviction was reversed and a new trial ordered, Becker was convicted a second time of the conspiracy to murder Rosenthal. Four other gamblers and gangsters were convicted. Dago Frank Serafici, Whitey Lewis, Harry Jip the Blood Horowitz, and Louis Rosenberg. All four were executed on April 13, 1914. Becker was executed on July 30, 1915, in the Sing Sing Prison Electric Chair, the only New York City police officer to face capital punishment. The execution was an excruciating event in which it took Becker more than nine minutes to die from numerous jolts of electricity. By the date of his execution, Prosecutor Whitman had gone on to be elected governor of New York State. Becker had sought clemency from Whitman, who by all rights should have recused himself from hearing Becker's plea because of the conflict of interest he had in deciding whether to spare Becker's life. 
Whitman turned down the plea for clemency. Becker's wife placed an engraved plaque on his wooden casket. Charles Becker, murdered July 30, 1915, by Governor Whitman. Becker went to his death protesting his innocence, and a number of organized crime historians believe he was framed. He was buried in Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx. Chapter 6 Mio Filio The murder in 1888 of Antonio Flacamillo and the press hoopla about the mafia was the first time New York City saw substantial publicity given to Italian organized crime groups. At that point, police at least had a glimmer of awareness that they were facing a new crime problem. They just didn't know much yet about who was involved. Giuseppe Morello is credited with being the first mafia boss of any substance in the city. In terms of physical appearances, Morello was a far cry from the dapper hoods who later became part of mafia folklore, such as Frank Costello and John Gotti. Morello dressed like a laborer, and with his thick, droopy mustache fit the stereotype of an Italian immigrant portrayed in the press. Known as the clutch hand because of a congenitally deformed right hand, Morello had emigrated from Sicily, where he had lived in the town of Corleone. Yes, that Corleone which became popularized in Mario Puzo's The Godfather as the inspiration for the name of his title character, Don Corleone. History is unclear as to when Morello arrived in New York, but by 1902 he was working out of a store located at 9 Prince Street, where he sold olive oil, spaghetti, and more of what the newspapers called Italian products. Morello is said to have left Sicily before authorities were able to prosecute him for a murder. He was apparently convicted in absentia for counterfeit-related offenses for which he received a prison sentence. Despite being handicapped with his withered hand, Morello earned a reputation for being a ruthless killer. His group was suspected of murdering an associate, putting his body in a sack, and tossing it off a cliff by the harbor in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. Morello's main criminal stock in trade was counterfeiting, but he hired a bunch of enforcers who took care of the homicides to enforce discipline in their criminal group, and to protect it from police. One of the headbreakers was Ignazio Lupo, known as the Wolf, who married Morello's sister and thus cemented a family loyalty between the two men. The brutality practiced by Morello's gang included the peculiar method of the barrel murder. Victims were slain and their remains folded up and placed in a large wooden barrel, such as the kind used for wine, and placed in a conspicuous public place so that cops would find the body. The first recorded mafia barrel murder in New York occurred in April 1903 when police found the corpse of Benedetto Madonia of Buffalo in a barrel in front of a building at 743 East 11th Street near Avenue D in Manhattan. Madonia's throat was cut from ear to ear and his body pocked with at least 18 stab wounds. The doctor who performed the autopsy said that it appeared Madonia had been asleep when he was attacked or held down while being tortured. An NYPD captain said it was one of the most remarkable cases he had seen in years. Barrels with the bodies inside would pop up around the city for years to come. As luck would have it, a group of Federal Secret Service agents, as well as a New York City policeman named Joseph Petrosino, had been watching Morello and his gang in a counterfeiting investigation. Petrosino, himself an Italian immigrant, was involved because he had been specially assigned to investigate crime in that immigrant community, and was gaining a name for himself for his proficiency in developing leads about the mafia. The federal agents identified the man found in the barrel as a person they had seen a few days earlier as he entered a butcher shop at 16 Stanton Street, in the company of the Morello gang. Police then moved quickly, raiding Morello's apartment at 178 Christie Street, where they found a trunk filled with letters written in Italian. A raid at a small pastry cafe at 226 Elizabeth Street, another address associated with Morello, uncovered some incriminating evidence, a barrel identical to the one in which the body of Madonia had been found. There was even sawdust found on the floor of the café that appeared similar to that found in the death barrel. Petrosino determined that Madonia was believed to have been on the verge of exposing the operations of Morello's U.S.-based counterfeiting ring. Petrosino also learned that Madonia's brother-in-law had earlier been convicted of counterfeiting, and may have been trying to have Madonia recover a share of the profits.
However, Madonia may have been more deeply involved in the counterfeiting ring than merely serving as an errand boy. One of the letters confiscated by police in the murder investigation revealed that Madonia had been sent by the Morello gang to revive a counterfeiting operation in Pittsburgh. But Madonia apparently didn't do a good job and, after complaining that Morello had unfairly criticized him, was preparing to quit and return home to Buffalo. Morello and seven other members of his group were arrested and held for a coroner's inquiry, the standard practice back then in New York City whenever there was a suspicious death. The evidence against the Morello group was at best circumstantial, and there didn't appear to be anything linking the gang to Madonia's murder. But since the federal agents in Petrosino had developed some evidence that Morello and his band had associated with the dead man in the hours before he died, the coroner ruled that they were all accessories to the killing and had them held. When the ruling was announced, the wives of some of the gang members became hysterical, and police had to separate them from their husbands before the courtroom bailiffs took the men away. The lack of evidence in the Barrel murder case forced prosecutors over an eight-month period to dismiss charges against Morello and a number of his men. Finally, in January 1904, the court released the last defendant to be held, Tommaso the Ox Petto, effectively ending the prosecution. The murder of Benedetto Madonia remains officially unsolved. For Petto, so strong that it took as many as three police officers to arrest him, things didn't end well. In October 1905, Petto, living under the name Luciano Perini, was shot dead near Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. But Morello seemed to thrive, consolidating his power and becoming a major mafioso in the city. Among his confederates was another tough Sicilian-born gangster named Joseph Masseria. A flinty-eyed man with a gluttonous appetite for food, Masseria had ambition and cunning. His time as a man to be reckoned with in the Mafia would come later. In the meantime, Morello kept his organization focused on counterfeiting. It would lead to his undoing. Since the Barrel murder of 1903, federal officials and New York police were keeping a closer eye on the Mafia and the related phenomena known as the Black Hand. Police officer Joseph Petrosino was instrumental in the formation of the NYPD Italian Squad, which focused on investigating organized crime in the Italian immigrant community in the early 20th century. While both the Mafia and the Black Hand were seen as synonymous, they both exploited Italian immigrants, there was a difference. Whereas the Mafia existed to make money for the organization through rackets, such as counterfeiting, the Black Hand was more a state of mind in the community, causing immigrants to be fearful of anonymous criminals who used extortion as a way to squeeze money out of their victims. Mafiosi did use extortion, but more often the Black Hand struck by sending notes, unsigned except for crude drawings of daggers or guns demanding money. At times, victims who ignored those demands had their places of business dynamited. Police officer Joseph Petrosino and others in the Italian squad spent a good portion of their time going after black-hand extortionists, as well as the more traditional Sicilian gangsters. One case they solved was the attempted extortion of opera star Enrico Caruso by the Black Hand. Petrosino also focused on Italian anarchists, doing such a good job that he learned of a plot to assassinate President William McKinley in Buffalo. But Petrosino's evidence was ignored, and McKinley was assassinated on September 6, 1901. Whenever there was a case involving the Mafia or the Black Hand, Petrosino was involved. He did so well at his job that in 1908, Petrosino was promoted to the rank of lieutenant, and in March 1909, he set sail for Sicily on what was described as a secret mission. However, news of Petrosino's investigative trip was widely known, and on the evening of March 12, 1909, outside a train station in Palermo, the crusading detective was shot multiple times and killed. He reportedly left his handgun back at his hotel and couldn't defend himself. Petrosino's death sparked a virulent campaign against the Black Hand, the older Camorra group, the Mafia, and any other variant of Italian organized crime. The newspaper The World offered a $1,000 reward for the capture and conviction of those responsible for Petrosino's murder, and the New York City government pledged $50,000 to fund a special unit to go after Italian organized crime, which now had earned its place as a public menace. Petrosino's body was shipped back to New York City aboard the SS Slavonia and arrived on April 9th. 
Four days later, Petrosino's funeral was held at the old St. Patrick's Cathedral at 260 to 264 Mulberry Street, and the procession was watched by an estimated 200,000 people. The city proclaimed the event a holiday so that people could take off from work to watch the event. Petrosino's body was then buried at Calvary Cemetery in Queens. In 1987, a small triangular park space bounded by Cleveland Place and Kenmore and Lafayette Streets, about two blocks north of the old police headquarters building at 240 Senna Street, was dedicated in Petrosino's honor. Meanwhile, back in Sicily, authorities identified five men, some with ties to New York and Giuseppe Morello, naming them as suspects in the Petrosino murder. None of them were ever brought to trial. If Morello was breathing a little easier with Petrosino's assassination, his respite didn't last very long. Morello and his crew had long been on the radar of law enforcement for counterfeiting. And eight months after Petrosino's death, Morello and several others were arrested on charges that they had smuggled fake $2 and $5 bills into the United States from Palermo, Sicily, in tins of olive oil, crates of olives, and cartons of spaghetti. The fake paper was also said to have been nicely printed at a farm upstate, but since they were churned out quickly, the bills were dead giveaways as counterfeit because they bore the same serial number, plate number, and series. Also arrested was Ignazio the Wolf Lupo, one of Morello's enforcers. Although he could break legs, he had a hard time running a small grocery store at 210 Mott Street and had previously fled New York, leaving behind a gaggle of creditors. After a nearly month-long federal trial, Morello, Lupo, and six others were convicted of counterfeiting offenses and hit with stiff prison sentences in February 1910. None of the mafiosi took their medicine stoically. Lupo cried into a handkerchief as the judge gave him a total of thirty years. Morello played for sympathy, holding out his deformed right hand for the judge to see. Then Morello told the court that he had a family to take care of, and that if the judge would only suspend his sentence, he would return to Italy immediately. The judge was unconvinced and hit Morello with a twenty-five-year sentence at which point the gangster collapsed in a faint and had to be helped by federal deputies. The long prison sentences sounded like the death knell for the Morello-Lupo gang, and officials proclaimed that black-hand extortions and mafia counterfeiting were now relegated to the past. But this was not going to be the case. There were plenty of Sicilian gangsters eager to assert themselves, regardless of how much Morello, through his half-brother Niccolo, tried to maintain control of his organization. Morello lost his appeal, and his half-brother was shot dead in Brooklyn in September 1916. The power vacuum was filled by Joseph Masseria, once one of Morello's lieutenants, but now a man who pulled together the various factions to be considered the top boss of all the mafia groups in the city. Masseria's main focus and his big money-making activity soon became bootlegging, once prohibition became the law of the land in 1918. He seemed to concern himself less with petty extortion and the business which had become known as the Black Hand. But average Italians in New York were still vulnerable to the extortion rackets run under the mantle of the Black Hand. The modus operandi of this group was to target Italian immigrants with an extortion demand, usually via a note that wasn't signed but had a rendering of a Black Hand, or Mano Nera. As revealed by the Enrico Caruso case, Investigated by the late Lieutenant Joseph Petrosino, Italians from all walks of life were targeted. When necessary, the extortionists would kill their victims. While the popular press painted many Italian gangsters with the label of the Black Hand, the meaning of the term actually became a subject of debate. Eventually, a number of loosely affiliated groups of criminals used the fear engendered by the Black Hand to make their own extortionate demands. One such case was the kidnapping of five-year-old Giuseppe Varada, one of the most notorious crimes attributed to the Black Hand in the period following World War I. Giuseppe, who was also known by the surname Varada, was mysteriously taken from his home at 354 East 12th Street on May 24, 1921, not long after his mother had given him a penny to buy some candy. The child's father was soon sent a ransom note requesting that he pay $2,500 for the safe return of his son. Little Giuseppe's father, Salvatore, got the kidnappers to agree to accept 
his entire life savings. But instead of paying the money, Salvatore Varada, working with Petrosino's Italian squad, helped to secure the arrest of the emissary who had been passing messages to the kidnappers. Petrosino's successor as head of the Italian squad was Michael Fiaschetti, a cop who had the reputation of using heavy-handed tactics with suspects. He would later write in a book about his career titled, You Have to Be Tough, which indicates his approach to crime fighting. Fiaschetti was unorthodox, and not only allowed Salvatore Varada to attend the interrogation of one of the suspects, but also permitted the father to beat the suspect in a last-ditch effort to find out what had happened to his son. But the police and Verrata were playing in dangerous territory. The kidnappers had already sent the father a crudely written note in which they threatened to not only kill Giuseppe if his family talked to the grand jury, but also to kill Fiaschetti. Against this backdrop of threats, it really wasn't a surprise that Giuseppe's body was found two weeks after his disappearance in the Hudson River, at Piermont, near the present-day Tappan Zee Bridge. Local police in Piermont, apparently lacking mortuary facilities, buried Giuseppe's body in a makeshift grave, stripping the corpse of clothing to use for identification purposes. Traveling with a police escort to the upstate river town, Giuseppe Varada recognized the clothing, a blue sailor blouse, khaki pants, and a distinctive red garter made by his mother, as that of his son, and sat in a stupor of grief for hours, according to one news account. At one point, the father pressed the wet clothing to his face, moaning the words, My boy, my boy, repeatedly. Police believed Giuseppe's killing happened soon after the kidnapper's intermediary was arrested in New York by Fiaschetti squad. Giuseppe was taken out into a boat on the Hudson River where he was garroted and his body thrown into the river. The discovery of the body resulted in a news media outcry against the Black Hand, but did little to salve the inconsolable pain of the parents, Salvatore and Antoinette Verrata. Mio figlio! Mio figlio! My son! My son! Mr. Verrata cried out as he tried to embrace his child's casket when it was brought into the family's apartment. He then stood by the casket, talking to his son and telling him that the killers would, by the grace of God, be caught. May the spirit of my little boy descend upon my unborn child, that he may avenge his brother's death, said a dazed and pregnant Antoinette Verrata, referring to the child she carried within her womb. Thousands took part in the public funeral, which filled the streets of the Union Square neighborhood where the family lived. The procession made its way to the Church of Mary, Help of Christians, at 436 East 12th Street. Women leaned out of tenement windows and wept. Neighbors gave the Verrata family a plate inscribed in Italian with the words, Victim of the Black Hand, we demand justice. Let justice be vindicated. As part of the funeral procession, the child's playmates, each wearing a black armband, followed the casket through the streets. Little Giuseppe's body was finally buried at Calvary Cemetery in Queens, also the resting place of Lieutenant Petrosino. The boy's tombstone bears an inscription proclaiming that he was kidnapped by the Black Hand, but even this symbolic act of defiance against the group drew threats. Before the modest monument was erected, Salvatore Verrata received a note that promised retribution if the Black Hand was castigated on the stone. The note was turned over to police, and the Verrata family ignored the warning. The Verrata murder was one of several blamed on the Black Hand, which had become one of the city's most odious criminal associations, as ill-defined and amorphous as it may have been. Even the New York Times was moved to editorialize about the child's death, commenting that the circumstances surrounding the murder of little Giuseppe Verrata emphasized the need of bringing his kidnappers to summary justice. Justice wasn't long in coming. Within days of the discovery of Giuseppe's body, several men were arrested for the child's murder. Salvatore Troia, Vincenzo Battaglia, Giuseppe Palestra, Santo Cusimano, Antonio Marino, John Melchione, Joseph Ruggieri, and Robert Raffaele. Cusimano, Marino, and Raffaele were convicted and sentenced to death although their capital punishments were changed to life in prison by Governor Alfred E. Smith. Giuseppe's tombstone still stands at Calvary, 
although the passage of time has made the lettering hard to read. There is evidence that the stone once had a photograph of the child attached in a special holder, as was the common practice of the day. But that disappeared a long time ago. Italian gangsters were the plague of their immigrant community and worked in coarse, brutal ways. At this point in history, they were for the most part disorganized. However, Jewish gangster Arnold Rothstein was the opposite of the Italian mob. Born to a well-to-do immigrant family, his father Abraham, a known racketeer, Arnold was known as a smart young man who had a head for mathematics and parlayed his obsession for gambling into a multi-million dollar empire that made him rich by the time he was thirty. His main gambling saloon was located on the west side of Manhattan. Rothstein became known as The Fixer and Mr. Big, and was reputed to have been involved in the 1919 Black Sox scandal, where the World Series was fixed. An investigation found no credible evidence that Rothstein was involved, and he was later quoted as saying that while he and his friends knew about the plan, they had turned it down. Rothstein worked quietly in the background of organized crime. Crime historians say that he was perhaps the most important racketeer of the era who convinced Italians and Irish to get organized and exploit the market potential given them by prohibition. Rothstein offered his services as a grand consigliere of sorts, mediating disputes between the various mob factions and using his high-level political connections with Tammany Hall to assert his power and put in fixes. He was also stylish, and even Charlie Luciano was quoted as giving Rothstein credit for teaching him how to dress. Rothstein became a legendary crime figure, and thanks to writer Damon Runyon, was known as the brain in popular culture for the way he organized the flow of liquor into the city from Europe and ran the rackets. His money was also parlayed into real estate, which he sometimes mortgaged to the hilt. Still, he stayed involved with gambling and wasn't afraid of higher-stakes games, which went on for weeks. But on November 4, 1928, Rothstein's luck and power came to an abrupt end. Two months earlier, in a bit of compulsive gambling, Rothstein had run up a debt of $320,000, $4.4 million today in one of a series of poker games he played. Faced with such losses, Rothstein said the games had been fixed and refused to pay. Another high roller involved, George McManus, took offense at the statement and, according to police, believed that Rothstein was the one who had fixed the game. Then, on that November day, while meeting with McManus and three other men, Rothstein was shot and seriously wounded in his room at the Park Central Hotel at the corner of 56th Street and 7th Avenue. Rothstein stumbled through the hotel and collapsed at the service entrance after asking the doorman to call a doctor in a taxicab. After doctors removed one bullet from his abdomen, Rothstein died on November 6th. McManus had left his overcoat behind in the room and was thus a prime suspect. Robbery was quickly ruled out as a motive as Rothstein had over $6,000 in his pockets, although at times he carried much more. Although he had been mortally wounded, Rothstein refused on his deathbed to tell police who had gunned him down. In fact, mob folklore has it that he told police sarcastically, Me Mutta did it, referring to his mother. Rothstein biographer David Pietruza in his book said the gambler's comment to cops was more like, You know me better than that, when asked who shot him. Although suspicion developed about several potential suspects, including the Jewish gangster Dutch Schultz, who had his own gambling business in the Bronx, police had a rough time trying to locate the suspects, some of who had apparently fled the city. Mayor Jimmy Walker had been pressuring his police commissioner, Joseph A. Warren, to show progress. And there were reports that Walker, who had his own problems, was pushing to sack Warren over City Hall's dissatisfaction with the pace of the investigation. About a month after Rothstein's murder, McManus was indicted and arrested, with Manhattan District Attorney Job Banton saying, We have an airtight case in this Rothstein murder. Well, as any gambler knows, there is never a sure thing, and the same holds true for an indictment. A year after he had so confidently bragged that the case against McManus was solid, Banton had to eat crow during the trial, admitting that he didn't have the witnesses or the evidence to make things stick. A judge directed a verdict of acquittal for McManus, 
prompting some jurors who had been hearing the evidence to remark that they would have cleared the defendant anyway. There seemed to be something about the way big-time gamblers felt about their mothers, because as soon as McManus heard the judge toss the indictment, he turned around with tears of joy in his eyes and whispered to his brothers, Tell Mama right away. After the jury formally pronounced him not guilty, McManus left the courthouse to visit his mother in the Bronx. After Rothstein's death, there was a battle over his will, which he had signed on his deathbed, apparently because of his injuries, with the notation X. He left an estate valued as high as $25 million, which was later found to be about $2.5 million, with debts, taxes, and various claims, whittling it down ultimately to $1.1 million. Rothstein's wife was left some cash, and a woman identified as girlfriend Inez Norton claimed she was to get proceeds from a $20,000 insurance policy, but lost out on her claim in court. Eventually, the dispute over the will was settled, and Rothstein's real estate holdings in Manhattan and the Bronx were sold off at auction. Still, it remained unclear whether all of Rothstein's money could be accounted for. His criminal ventures were believed to have been split up among other gangsters. He also had an interest in a phantom village of 143 empty houses in Maspeth, Queens, which officials believed was part of some scam to steal from the city. True to his Jewish heritage, Rothstein was buried with an Orthodox service at the Union Field Cemetery in Queens. Chapter 7 The War of the Bosses Joseph Masseria's rise as a top mafioso was attributed to the rise of bootlegging and his own brand of luck. Over the years, Masseria had dodged several assassination attempts. In one incident at the intersection of 2nd Avenue and 5th Street in Manhattan, the stocky Masseria was able to dodge three bullets fired at point-blank range. The only thing damaged was the crown of his straw hat when one of the rounds passed right through it. Umberto Valenti the bootlegger believed to have arranged the failed assassination plot, wasn't so lucky. He was shot dead four days after that attempt on Masseria's life. It was suspected that Valenti was killed by a young Lower East Side hood named Charles Luciano. Masseria was questioned about the attempted hit, but the only thing he could tell police was that he had replaced the hat damage during the attack. Despite his 25-year sentence for counterfeiting, Giuseppe Morello was let out of federal prison early after he received a pardon from President Warren Harding. With virtually no power left as a mafia boss, Morello ostensibly agreed to take a back seat to Masseria, his former underling. Morello also changed his first name to Peter, apparently to mask his criminal past. Earlier attempts to assassinate Masseria were believed to have been instigated by Morello loyalists, so there remained an undercurrent of suspicion between the two men. Another view of this period in Mafia history holds that one Salvatore Toto d'Aquila, alternately described as a cheese and olive importer, as well as being in real estate, had risen to power after Morello had gone to prison and become the so-called capo de capi, or top dog among Italian mob bosses. D'Aquila had been associated with Morello, but had split off to run his own operation after old Clutch Hand was convicted. Aquila's rise to power was most recently discussed by author C. Alexander Hortus in his book, The Mob and the City, The Hidden History of How the Mafia Captured New York. Hortus cites as a key source the recollections of Nicola Gentili, a mob associate in the 1920s. Although he was a businessman who police said didn't seem to have a regular place of business but used his hat to keep his papers, the Kia did have an arrest record stretching back to 1906 that included being charged as a confidence man. Whatever he did for a living, D'Aquila seemed well off and dressed the part, wearing stylish suits, silk shirts with white collars, and expensive cravats. He lived in a nicely appointed home on Southern Boulevard in the Bronx, which he left late on October 10, 1928, to drive his wife into Manhattan to visit a cardiologist. The couple's four children also made the trip. Leaving his wife with the doctor... Aquila walked outside to the corner of Avenue A and 13th Street to check on his car. It was then that three men approached and started talking with D'Aquila for several minutes. The discussion turned into an argument, and then five shots were fired, after which D'Aquila dropped dead by his sedan. A newspaper report noted that it was lights out for D'Aquila, just as the streetlights were being lit. <laughs>
According to Hortus and other crime historians, the death of Dequila cleared the way for Maseria to become the top mafia captain, even as he himself avoided further assassination attempts. He was viewed as the major boss of the Sicilian mafia in the city of